One is when a man has searched himself diligently and by a serious examination passed through all the commandments of God, and yet after such examination and search made, his particular offenses are yet hidden and not revealed unto him. So as he cannot call them to remembrance, then the general repentance is accepted. For this is answerable to the practice of David, who after long search, when he could not attain to the knowledge of her, his particular slips, then he addresses himself to a general humiliation, saying, Who knoweth the heirs of this life? Cleanse me, Lord, from my secret faults. And upon this he was no doubt accepted. Again, when a man humbleth himself, and yet is prevented by the time, so as he cannot search his heart and life as he would, his general repentance will be taken and accepted of God. The truth hereof appears in the thief upon the cross, who having no time to search himself, made no special humiliation, yet upon his general confession he was accepted. Now the ground of this doctrine is this, he that truly repents of one sin, when he is presented, is as if he repented of all. Number two case. What must a man do that finds himself hard-hearted and of a dead spirit, so as he cannot humble himself as he would? Answer. Such persons, if they humble themselves, they must be content with that grace which they have received. For if thou be truly and unfeignedly grieved for this, that thou canst not be grieved, thy humiliation shall be accepted. For that which Paul saith of alms may be truly said in this case, that if there be a ready mind, a man shall be accepted, according to that he hath, and not according to that he hath not. Third case, whether the party that is more grieved for loss of his friend than for offense of God by his sin, doeth or can truly humble himself. Answer, a man may have a greater grief for an earthly loss than for the other, and yet be truly grieved for his sins too. The reason is because that is a bodily, natural, and sensible loss, and accordingly sorrow for it is natural. Now the sorrow for the offending of God is no sensible thing, but supernatural and spiritual, and sensible things do more affect and urge the mind than the other. David did not notably humble himself for his sins, and he did exceedingly mourn for the loss of his son Absalom, yet and more too than for his sins. Would God I had died for thee, Absalom! O oh, Absalom, my son, my son! Again I answer that the sorrow of the mind must be measured by the intention of the affection and by the estimation of the thing for which we sorrow. Now sorrow for sin, though it be less in respect of the intention thereof, yet it is greater in respect of the estimation of the mind, because they which truly mourn for their sins grieve for the offense of God as the greatest evil of all, and for the loss of the favor of God as for the loss of the most excellent and precious thing in the world. Number four case. Whether it be necessary in humiliation that the heart should be smitten with a sensible sorrow, Answer 1. In sorrow for sin, there are two things. First, to be displeased for our sin. Second. Secondly, to have a bodily moving of the heart, which causes crying and tears. The former of these is necessary, namely in heart to be deeply displeased with ourselves. The latter is not simply necessary, though it be commendable in whomsoever it is, if it be in truth. For Lydia had the first, but not the second. Number two, it falleth out oftentimes that the greatness of the grief taketh away the sensible pain and causeth a numbness of the heart, so that the party grieveth not. Number three, sometimes the complexion will not afford tears, and in such there may be true humiliation, though with dry cheeks. Section three. The second thing to be done for the attaining of God's favor, and consequently of salvation, is to believe in Christ. In the practice of a Christian life, the duties of humiliation and faith cannot be severed. Yet for doctrine's sake, I distinguish them. In faith there are two things required, and to be performed on our behalf. First, to know the points of religion, 
and namely the sum of the gospel, especially the promise of righteousness and life eternal by Christ. Secondly, to apprehend and apply the promise, and with all the things promised, which is Christ unto ourselves. And this is done when a man upon the commandment of God sets down this with himself, that Christ and his merits belong unto him in particular, and that Christ is his wisdom, justification, sanctification, and redemption. This doctrine is plain out of the sixth chapter of John. For Christ that there propounded unto us is the bread and the water of life. Therefore faith must not be idle in the brain, but it must take Christ and apply him unto the soul and conscience, even as meat is eaten. The questions of conscience touching faith are these. First, how we may truly apply Christ with all his benefits unto ourselves. For wicked men apply Christ unto themselves falsely in presumption, but few do it truly as they ought to do. I answer that this may be done. We must remember to do two things. First, lay down a foundation of this action and then practice upon it. Our foundation must be laid in the word or else we shall fail in our application. And it consists of two principles. The one is, as God gives a promise of life eternal by Christ, so he gives commandment that everyone in particular should apply the promise to himself. The next is, that the ministry of the word is an ordinary means wherein God does offer and apply Christ with all his benefits to the hearers, as if he called them by their names, Peter, John, Cornelius, believe in Christ and thou shalt be saved. When we have rightly considered of our foundation, the second thing is to practice upon it, and that is to give ourselves to the exercises of faith and repentance, which stand in meditation of the word, in prayer for mercy and pardon. And when this is done, then God gives the sense and increase of his grace. When Lydia was hearing the sermon of Paul, then God opened her heart, Acts 16, verse 12. Secondly, it is demanded, when faith begins to breed in the heart, and when a man begins to believe in Christ, answer, when he begins to be touched in conscience for his own sins, and withal hungers and thirsts after Christ, and his righteousness then beginneth faith. The reason is plain. As faith is renewed, so it is begun. But it is renewed when a man is touched in conscience for his sins, and begins anew to hunger after Christ. Therefore, when these things first show themselves, then faith first begins. For these were the things that were in David when he renewed his repentance. Section 4. Repentance. The third duty necessary to salvation is repentance, in which two things are to be considered. A beginning, namely a godly sorrow, which is the beginning of repentance, 2 Corinthians 7, and upon this sorrow a change, which is indeed repentance itself. In sorrow we consider first the nature of it, secondly the properties of it. Not in the nature of sorrow, it is either inward or outward. The inward sorrow is when a man is displeased with himself for his sins. The outward when the heart declares the grief thereof by tears, or such like signs. And sorrow in this case, called a godly sorrow, is more to be esteemed by the first of these than by the second. The property of this sorrow is to make us to be displeased with ourselves for our sins directly because they are sins and do displease God. If there were no judge, no hell, nor death, yet we must be grieved because we have offended so merciful a God and loving Father. And as godly sorrow will make us thus to do, so it is the next cause of repentance, and by this is repentance discerned. The next thing in repentance is the change of the mind and the whole man in affection, life, and conversation. And this standeth in a constant purpose of the mind and the resolution of the heart, not, not to sin, but in everything to do the will of God. Hereupon Paul exhorteth them to whom he wrote to continue in the love of God and in the obedience of his word. Barnabas, when he came to Antioch and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto God or continue with the Lord. So the prophet Ezekiel saith, If the wicked will turn from all his sins 
and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. And this purpose stands a very nature of repentance, and it must be joined with humiliation and faith as a third thing available to salvation and not to be severed from them. For a man in show may have many good things, as for example he may be humbled and seem to have some strength of faith. Yet, if there be in the said man a want of the purpose and resolution not to sin, the others are but dead things and unprofitable, and for all of them he may come to eternal destruction.